and welcome to The Collegium, our monthly magazine program in three parts. Cinema, State of Affairs, and our arts calendar. Hello and welcome to The Collegium, our monthly magazine program in three parts. Cinema, State of Affairs, and our arts calendar. For our cinema presentation tonight, we bring you My Hometown, guest artist, Janetta Johnson Page. For our State of Affairs One, we're very pleased to have with us Erica Gregor from the Freunde der Deutschen Kinematik Verein and the Kino Arsenal. For State of Affairs Two, we bring you Anne from the Initiativa Anders Arbeiten. So two ladies with a lot of information to share with us. So in addition to staying cool, remember you are participating in the Collegium. Johnson Page, the music you sing is inspirational. Could you tell us a little bit about why it moves you the way it seems to and why it moves us, we the listeners, when you perform it? Well, I believe the reason that it moves and inspires it's because a lot of it is born out of personal experiences. Be quiet. The personal relationship uh, that I have with Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And the encouragement that it gives others because of my experiences as well as those of others who have gone on before. It's um, based primarily on innermost feelings, the soul if you will. Uh, the idea of giving others encouragement to strive forward, realizing that all of the trials and tribulations and problems that we encounter are temporary and that we're going to justly be rewarded as a result of them. So I think it moves and inspires because of the pathos that's in, involved, um, of the sincerity with which it has to uh, come forth. Um, Rhythm and all are very, I think, um, insignificant things, if you will, as far as the message. The message is what moves and inspires, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the history of this music? Well, it's gospel. And uh, actually, gospel in America began in the early 1920s. Um, Thomas Dorsey is credited with being the father of gospel music, and he was something of a jazz pianist and did a little honky tonk playing and all. And after he gave his life to Christ, um, many of the spirituals and, and gospel uh, hymn tunes, rather, that he had heard were gospelized, if you will. Um, many hymn writers more or less set the, the foundation, if you will, for hymnody. Uh, and gospel music as we know it today. 
and with Dorsey's input and, and, and those of, of singers and, and instrumentalists and uh, choirs, James Cleveland is the, I guess, the, the major thrust of what's going on now, along with the Hawkins and uh, Crouch and a few others. Um, their input was one of, well, how can I say that, one of um, uh, genius, I suppose we'll say. Um, from the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, and 50s, with Mahalia Jackson and all coming in, it's like the, the, the gospel was what the church world had to say to what was going on to the world, uh, in the world. Uh, there was the blues that was running counter, if you will, for the secular uh, parts of society. And the church wanted to verbalize this musically so. And so gospel music, if you will, was born and is still a very viable uh, medium of expression because it's, it's contemporary. Back to that. How do you find that the music that you sing, uh, how does it communicate to people who don't understand or speak the same language that you do? It's very well received. Mm -hmm. uh, this past summer I was fortunate to do a workshop in Arezzo, Italy, and there were um, members of, of my class from Poland, uh, German, Italian as well. And of course, there was an enormous uh, language barrier, if you will, as far as conversation, but never in the music, mm -hmm. never in the music. We were able to um, verbalize and communicate through the idiom of gospel music. Mm -hmm. it, it has never been a problem because people feel, mm -hmm. if you will, they feel and they understand what it is that you're saying. Uh, in what you're doing, regardless of whether it's English or German or Yiddish or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There also seems to be a factor of release, perhaps psychological release or emotional release mm -hmm. in the music, both for the performers and the listeners. To be sure. Can you explain that dynamic to us? Mm -hmm. What's happening and why? Mm -hmm. uh, there's an old uh, a Negro spiritual entitled... Um, Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Mm -hmm. And what gospel music uh, endeavors to convey is, is what does happen when an individual lays those burdens down. Okay? Um, and, and when we're talking about burdens, Christianity does not promise that there will not be burdens, but it does assure us that we will have the presence of God. Uh, in every situation and in every circumstance. And so the confidence of that fact comes through and it permeates in the singing. When you know that you've been in a dark trial or a dark situation and it seemed that there was no way that that problem was going to be solved. You know, when you've seen a marriage that was tottering and, and, and about to dissolve and you've seen God step in 
and make a way out of no way. Then when you sing, glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down, since you gave that problem or since you gave that situation to God, and since he worked it out, then when you sing, that sense of freedom is there. There's a scripture that says that who the Son of God sets free is free indeed. And there is freedom. There is freedom. There is absolute liberty. And that cannot help but be conveyed in your singing. What is the future in a seemingly increasingly secular society or materialistic society? What is the future for, for God? And what is the future for the type of communication that uh, one thinks you aspire towards with this music? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm certainly not worried about God being anything less than God. Um, the scripture says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. So him, I have absolute confidence in. I'm sure that he's always going to remain the same. Uh, as far as uh, the future for gospel music, I do indeed see some changes that have been made um, as far as secularism is concerned. I've seen that there have been some compromises made, if you will, in not only the text of music, but in the style of music. I think some efforts have been made to take gospel music uh, to the world, and sometimes the message itself has been altered. I do not feel that compromise needs to be made. And that is what I fear has happened um, in many respects. That really began as early as the 60s, to be quite honest with you. Uh, there was a song entitled, um, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. And Gladys Knight and the Pips had just said that you're the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. And as you see, the relationship that was likened between God and man and man and woman are, are quite different. They're, they're very quite different, and there certainly is no comparison. Although I do think we learn a lot of things about the nature of God in marriage, but still, it seems to me that a compromise was, was made when attempts were made to minimize, if you will, the holiness and the sovereignty of God. I do believe that there will always be a degree of purity, if you will. I'm a gospel purist. I should say, because I think that nothing should be done to take away from the message of gospel music. And gospel means good news. It's the good news of Christ, the good news that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the best news I know. You know? So I feel that the future is going to continue to be one of promise because I believe that people will always feel an emptiness and a need in their lives to come to the realization that Christ is the way. And in coming to that fact that they will maintain the integrity, if you will, not only of the music, but of the message and of God's word.
does for me. I'm willing to take God's part, for God is real, for I can feel Him in my heart. Oh, yes, God is real. He's real in my soul. Yes, God is real, for He has washed and made me whole. Ooh, His love for me is like pure gold, for God is real. soul oh yes God is real real in my soul yes God is real And welcome to our State of Affairs 1 portion of the program, where we're very pleased to have with us as our guest, Erica Gregor. Erica, welcome to the Collegium. Thank you. I mentioned in the opening the Freunde der Deutschen Kinematik and the Kino Arsenal. For people that are not so familiar with those organizations, perhaps you could tell us a little bit of the history of, of those two. It all started with some uh, students at the Free University who made the Students Film Club and then decided one day that uh, the Berlin Senate had just bought the archive of Mr. Lamprecht, who was a well-known director in the 20s and uh, later, but his most uh, famous films like Emil und die Detektive are at the end of the 20s. And he was also a collector of films. So when the Senate bought the films, these young enthusiasts thought that now they have to be shown. And because at that time there was no archive, there was no film culture. And so they went to Mr. Lambrecht and said, Yet now you're going to show it. And then he said, no, children, I'm too old. You do it. That's why our organization is called Friends of the German Kinematik, because they believed they were the friends. And they started to, in the Academy of Arts in West Berlin to show films. And uh, the first film was uh, like a manifesto. It was a film from the good times of the German cinema in the 20s, Das Wachsfiguren Kabinett by Paul Leni, who later had to emigrate, and the newest things by the just forming new German cinema, the first films by Kluge, Reitz, and others. And the second uh, screening was uh, in June 1963 with Juarez, a film by William Dieterle, another German director who had to emigrate to uh, Hollywood and worked there. And the third uh, screening was already a film from other parts of the world, Satya Yatre's uh, Pata Pankali. So it was uh, that we wanted to look into our own past we wanted to help the newcomers, their films to be shown, and we also wanted to give our audience uh, films of the world. How were these efforts received, both by the public and also by the authorities, the supporting authorities, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the public was enthusiastic. We had uh, full uh, screenings, but the authorities uh, uh, couldn't care less. Uh, we had uh, no uh, subsidies for the first eight years. But I must say that we also didn't ask for subsidies because we felt uh, we were not quite content with our government and our uh, country, and we felt we should, uh, it is a question of our generation, keep away from the state. So it never occurred to us to ask uh, for uh, subsidies. Maybe they would have given, I don't know. Mm. But we could all, uh, we had nobody to work for us but ourselves. And uh, the bookkeeper, you need to have good bookkeeping, <laughs> and the projectionist, and the rest we did ourselves. And uh, uh, I did all we did all with two friends. And my husband, for instance, was uh, earning a living as a film critic, and he was a film historian and television critic. And with that money, we could live. In the 60s, you needn't uh, have a lot of money in West Berlin. And what were the motivational factors that led you and, and, and your husband, Ulrich Gregor, and, and, and your colleagues to work under these circumstances for so long? Well, first, we loved the work. Okay. We absolutely loved it. We didn't find, we didn't think it was work. It was our pleasure. And second, well, we had uh, not less in mind than to change the world and change our country because we thought that uh, after what had happened uh, in the 30s and 40s that we, everybody needed to help to create a better Germany. It is a little pathetic, but we were like that. And do you see the kind of ingredients that will lead uh, the current or future generations to undertake the kind of activities that you have undertaken? I think it is now much more difficult because uh, there are communal cinemas, there are archives, and there is television. At that time, television was just starting, and people like to go uh, to see old films. And also, there was uh, films from the 20s, or films from uh, faraway countries, had not been introduced, mm -hmm. not even in festivals. You could occasionally see at the Venice Film Festival a film by Kurosawa, or Ray, or in Berlin also. But it was not as it is today that you can find these films more easily. And that makes life and work more difficult. And how did you begin your relationship with the Berlin Film Festival? Well, that is, the Berlin Film Festival was uh, what they called uh, the, uh, the Schaufenster der Freien Welt, the showroom of the free world. And it was, uh, of course, it was East Berlin, West Berlin. There was no wall. And it was also meant to show what the free world could present. And lots of East Berliners would come. Then, after the uh, wall, you had uh, some of the films and news over television. And, but in the 60s, West Berlin was a very interesting place because people from uh, uh, Ger West Germany would go there. For instance, if you lived in West Berlin, you needn't become a soldier. Lots of people didn't want to become soldiers, and so they went to West Berlin. Also, it was interesting because if you had a West German passport, you could still go to East Berlin. So you had the two worlds. And also we were very near Poland, very near the Soviet Union. And what we did, we tried very hard to show films from Poland and from the Soviet Union and also East Germany. And I must say that the public always followed us and also the newspapers. And then in the middle 60s, end of the 60s, uh, there were the huge anti-Vietnam War demonstrations and people became more critical and the film festival did not change. And then some stupid things happened and in 1970 uh, the festival collapsed. It closed down two days before it should have ended. The jury members left and instead of going to see films, uh, people were debating and having sit-ins. We were, at the same time, still working for our little society, and we had 
just for fun, already established two years, our own festival with no money whatsoever. But we would show new films, old films, for instance, we would show a film by Feuillard and then a new film. And um, we had fantasy, we had ideas. And 1970, we had already our own little cinema in the Welserstraße. So we were working there, and then the festival collapsed. And in the month after the collapse of the festival, they must have been thinking very hard. And the festival was financed, as most things in West Berlin, half by the government in Bonn and half by the Senate of Berlin. And at the end of November, beginning of December, they suddenly came up with the idea that the film festival would go on as it had always been, mm -hmm. but for the unruly leftists, they would have a playground, and the playground should be provided by us, the friends of the German Film Archive. They thought that we will show, show all the difficult films, the leftist films, the avant-garde films, which we did. Mm -hmm. And we got a contract three months before it was to be for one year. And we did our festival always in mind that it would be the first and the last because we did everything we could. We, uh, and uh, we had two advantages. First, we had been to other festivals for 10 years and we could uh, rely on what we didn't like. We did all the things we didn't like uh, in other festivals, uh, the opposite. Mm -hmm. And the second was that we were fresh. We had for the first time a secretary. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we started, and the first thing I told the secretary was that she reminded me 29 years later that she would probably only be employed for six months mm -hmm. because we would do the festival, uh, the government wouldn't like it, and then we would have a few months to put everything in order. And that she, she thought, well, she's so good, uh, she can easily find a new job. But the public, we were an instant success. The public liked us. And the government uh, thought it was wise to let us continue. But for many years, we always only got a contract for one year, which I think is very good because I don't like uh, security so much. In private life, yes. You know, I have been married with my husband for um, over 40 years. That's fine. But in your work and what you do in a festival, you should take all chances. With the idealism with which you approached uh, this bringing uh, cinema from different parts of the world to Berlin, how did the construction of the wall affect you artistically, emotionally, intellectually? Uh, well, for us, the wall uh, was not um, hindering us to go to East Berlin and also to go to the Moscow Film Festival. And we, but we thought from the first form that we should include East European films. And already in the first form, we had Soviet cinema. But because some of the most famous films by Eisenstein, Bertov, S. V. Schub, Kulishov had never been to Germany. Because in the 20s, somehow they didn't make it, the films from the 30s, of course not, and after the war also. And at that time, the huge uh, Gospel Fund, the state archive of the Soviet Union, was led by a wonderful old man, Mr. Privato, whom we had known. And in the Soviet Union, you are respected when you write books. And my husband had written books, History of the Cinema. So Mr. Privato liked us. And when we asked him whether we could get uh, the old films for our festival, he said, yes, the Gregors will get them. So from the first form, while we were, the festival was still the showcase of the free world, we had these communist films in our program. But, uh, and we could buy them, because when we uh, got um, the money, we said two conditions. First, we get the money as a whole. Second condition, nobody interferes with our programming. So we were able to even buy prints and subtitle them. And so in, and then in the mid 70s, they changed the structure of the Berlin Film Festival because they wanted uh, to have the East uh, European uh, festival uh, countries to participate. And then we could also have new Soviet 
Hungarian Polish films, which was very easy for us because we knew the people there. We had been to international festivals where they had been. And I remember one year the head of the Hungaro film, Mr. Doshai, he tried to give us a new a Hungarian film. But then the order came from uh, in, in Moscow, he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And when he finally was allowed to do it, he said, this is this, their zweite Anlauf, the second try. But then it was possible. When we have email and internet and uh, all of these um, broadband communications, in the times that you're describing, that technology wasn't there. How did you manage to communicate, uh, establish public relations? How did you know about them and vice versa? How did the filmmakers find you and you find them? Well, it... Uh there was something like telex, but we didn't even have our own telex. We had to go to the competition people if we had telexes. Sure. T uh, telephone was difficult. Even to telephone Rome, we had one person who would sit for two hours to telephone Rome. And uh, East Berlin was impossible. At some time, uh, somebody would go to East Berlin because to telephone the East Berlin people from Friedrichstraße, S-Bahnhof. Uh, but we would meet, and we would have a lot of things were done verbally. We would meet at other festivals. We would say what we wanted. We would see these films. We would go every year in winter two days to uh, Warsaw to see all the new films. Mm -hmm. And they were absolutely wonderful. We would see all the films, even the forbidden ones. We would see them, of course, in the evening. Mm -hmm. But we, w we could see them and then they would say, well, this you cannot get, this you cannot get. But the great advantage wa was that they considered uh, us as film historians uh, who must know everything. But with some, f some films they just said, you see them, but please never write a letter or over the telephone uh, request this film unless we signal you can. I remember that with one film we had to wait 11 years and then suddenly we got a telegram from Budapest uh, if we are still interested in this film. Uh, it was The Witness, a very funny comedy. Uh, we could get it. And we, of course, said yes. Telegrams were very good. And we had a network of people whom we knew who would tell us. And this network, you know, if you are in one field of work, you meet people who love the same things you love. And you are, it is like a secret family. And so we had a brother in Moscow, we had another brother in Budapest, we had a cousin in Warsaw, we had somebody in uh, Vienna, we had somebody in Rome, we had somebody in uh, Tokyo, of course. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, a secret network where people signal you things. And what about the future? Where do you go from here? Well, we are still helping with the Arsenal program. Mm -hmm. The Arsenal moved, of course, had to move now to the Potsdamer Platz. So we have a cinema at the Potsdamer Platz, two cinemas even. And the forum is still existing. And uh, I uh, hope that my husband will write the third part of his history of the cinema. And I hope to, uh, some time, uh, to have some time to put order in our house because for 20 years I have put down everything <laughs> and not cleared up. And now I hope to find time to do the, some of these things. Well, at least it's all in one place. Yes. <laughs> Erica Gregor, it's been a pleasure to have you here on the program. Thank you very much for joining us here on the Collegium. Thank you, Donna. And please come back again sometime. Okay. okay. So stay with us, and remember, you are participating in The Collegium. Welcome to our State of Affairs portion two of the program, where we're very pleased to join our program guest, Anne. Hello, Anne. Welcome Hello. to The Collegium. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about this organization that you work with, Initiative Anders Arbeiten. Well, it's called 
initiative for working differently. And it's an, an initiative that wants to redefine work and not that we work just to survive, that we live and uh, that we have a chance to have uh, an existence and income where we can live in dignity and where we can um, live in a self-defined way and uh, that today a lot of people are forced to work and maybe sometimes in three jobs and it's very difficult for them to survive on the little money that they have or um, they are doing work which is not being paid like caring for children or caring for elder people and so that's why we want to redistribute work and also have an income that is independent of how much work, paid work, people are doing and um, share the work that has been done. What is the relationship between what you've just, just described and the Hearts Fear for program? Well, it's a new law that is, uh, has been decided already in, in Germany and is to be introduced by January 2005. And uh, a lot of people are protesting against this new law because it means that the uh, welfare benefits and the um, unemployment benefits are being merged. And uh, in fact, it means a reduction for those people um, that used to receive unemployment uh, benefits uh, to the level of welfare benefits. And it means that uh, people will have to uh, take up jobs for one euro an hour and it's going to be very difficult for them if they used to have a job and received a lot of money and uh, all of a sudden they will survive, have to survive on one hour, uh, one euro an hour and that's really a very difficult change and uh, it's also uh, the law is not taking into account that the people uh, for example in eastern Germany they have been trying to uh, get a job that they can live on and uh, there just is such a high unemployment, like an uh, unemployment rate of 20%. So it is impossible to, to actually care for these people. There are, will not be enough jobs for these people. So this law is, uh, is the wrong law to tackle the situation that we have, especially in Eastern Germany. And that's why the protests every Monday have been much uh, bigger in Eastern Germany because uh, uh, the people there are uh, more affected by this law and uh, they think the, um, this is not the correct, correct way to deal with the situation. So they wanted to change the situation and the best thing would be to stop this law. How would you then approach this economic situation here in Germany in such a way that you would feel that there would be a more egalitarian uh, or fair, if you will, distribution of the wealth so that uh, the hearts for could be negated? Well, the, the thing would be to uh, have a look of, at uh, what is being produced and mm -hmm. why and uh, we are producing a lot of things that are ecologically questionable, um, unsustainable, and uh, there is a lot of high consumption among parts of the society, whereas other parts of the society uh, barely can afford uh, to, to survive and, and uh, cannot afford the goods that are being produced. Uh, and uh, so we need a redistri redistribution and also um, some people work at 60 hours a week, whereas other people would like to work but cannot find a job that suits their qualification or they do not have the qualification that is uh, needed. And so, uh, or they are working and not receiving payment for the work that they're doing. And so this has to be redistributed. And uh, we have to f wonder, do we need so many cars or should we produce more ecological ways of transport? and? all sorts of other things and uh, this should be just, um, there should be an open debate uh, in the society on, on what do we need and, and uh, have a more uh, self-determined ways for people to work. In an uh, ec economy where the, the profit motive seems to be increasingly, or the bottom line seems to be increasingly the point, and a growing disparity between the rich and the poor, how do you plan to motivate the persons who control the levers of power to move in the directions that you're suggesting? 
Well, uh, the best thing is uh, that people realize um, the, the society, the way it is organized, um, independently of whether they are rich or poor, they would like to change it, and they have the, the motive because they think no, uh, uh, they need to change it. It's no good in telling other people this needs to be changed and they don't agree, then, because you need an agreement for, for people to, to get together and, and change things. And uh, I mean, one way of signaling to people that think um, this society, the way, it's, uh, the way it is, I would like to change it, usually they say, well, I don't think there's any possibility of changing anything. I mean, the politicians don't listen to uh, protests, uh, they seem to carry on as they did before, so we also need to show people, well, there are people protesting and um, let's get together and then discuss together on how we can change things. How do you respond to uh, uh, the good fellow Rumsfeld referring to some of the countries in Europe as being nanny states, uh, particularly in comparison to the way that uh, the, the population is, say, uh, dealt with in the United States, the population as a whole, particularly the population that doesn't have money? Well, um, I think uh, there is a high percentage in the United States of, of people who are, who are just uh, in, in prison, so I don't think that is the way of dealing with people that um, sort of uh, don't fit the, into society the way Rumsfeld wants them to fit into society. And uh, I also think that people who went to the streets like on the 15th of February 2003 to, to protest against the war in Iraq, I mean, they definitely uh, went on the streets to, uh, to show their opinion. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that there is this large uh, uh, amount of people that say, um, we'll just not uh, keep quiet, but we'll say what we think. And uh, yeah, it's uh, a good thing. There is a school of economic thought that in, uh, in order to produce capital, it, it is not a wise idea to invest in social projects, but rather the money has to be put in projects or undertakings that are almost assured uh, of making more money. With that emphasis, if the, if the economic situation is moving in this direction, what is the prescription for the people who are being left out? Well, the, the thing is that we, we need a different kind of economy that does not follow the principle of profit at all costs for a small number of transnational corporations. But uh, we have to redefine uh, what economy is for, and uh, we have to redefine uh, this, this principle. It would be a different principle to put people first, to put uh, ecology, to put nature first, and then we would find that this principle of producing uh, more and more uh, uh, material and using the highest amount of resources, which is uh, considered uh, economical, but uh, it's not ecological, so uh, we have to f find a new way of organizing economy so that uh, uh, it's not the shareholder's value that counts most. How hopeful a sign do you find the kind of undertakings that seem to be led by Lula Ignacio da Silva from Brazil, and also the current discussions that are being undertaken in the Security Council in the United Nations, that there is a reapportionment of uh, involvement in the distribution of wealth between North and South? Well, I think uh, we certainly do need a, a more equal, uh, an equal, not just a more equal, but an equal distribution of wealth between North and South. And uh, any attempt uh, to redefine uh, distribution towards eco ecological e um, equality is a good sign. So uh, Lula is, is also being criticized by the movements. They think he's not doing enough. So he's under a lot of pressure from, from the IMF and the, the World Bank. So uh, we have to increase the, the grassroots pressure for, for change so that uh, the, there is a possibility uh, for, for Lula to make these decisions. 
And what are the future plans for your organization? Well, our future plans is uh, a lot of um, discussions connecting with, with other people, people from, from north, from south, connecting with migrants and all sorts of diverse people and also to to educate ourselves and uh, find ways and alternatives, alternatives to economy and, and find ways of redefining work, uh, fighting for uh, an existence, income, so uh, we've got a lot to do still. <laughs> and thank you very much for joining us here on the Collegium and good luck with your very worthwhile ideas. Thank you. <laughs> so that's it this evening for the Collegium. But stay with us until the end, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday and all of the following Sundays. Thanks a lot. <laughs>